Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Philip Reed from BiQ. Thank you for taking the time to participate in today's workshop. This is the seventh in a series of workshops delivered in this webinar format. Today's workshop topic focuses on the DOD acquisition and contracting process. Today, we are going to focus on the acquisition lifecycle, contracting and accounting. I wanna make a quick note about questions. Normally, we allocate ample time for questions during these workshops. However, because today's content is very rich and covers three very complex topics, we may have less time than usual for participant questions. However, questions we received prior to the workshop were incorporated into today's content, and so we're confident many of your questions will be answered. We'll also send an audio recording within two days of the workshop, as well as a transcript within 30 days. Next slide, please. All participant microphones are muted for the duration of the webinar. Today's workshop is structured as follows. Presentation, panel discussion, brief Q&A, and a post-workshop feedback survey. At the end of this webinar, you'll be automatically redirected to a page where you'll be asked to provide some feedback regarding today's workshop. It should take you less than five minutes to complete the survey. We will also send the survey to the email you use to register. If you have questions during the workshop, please click on the blue question mark located at the top of the page. Please limit today's questions to the scope of this workshop's topics. Next slide, please. The objective of today's workshop is to give you an understanding of the DOD acquisition lifecycle, SBIR and non-SBIR government contracting and accounting essentials. Next slide, please. Today we are joined by presenters and panelists with vast federal acquisition, contracting and accounting expertise in support of small businesses. I'd like to remind all of our speakers to please state your name, organization and role prior to your presentation, as well as during the panel discussion. Today, our moderators are myself, Philip Reeves, and Lynn Jenkins, also from Bicube. We also have with us Kirk Byrne from Bicube, Chris Harris, and Kevin Duncan from K. Duncan & Company. I'd now like to introduce our first presenter, Kirk Byrne from Bicube, to take us through the acquisition process. Kirk, please take it away. Thank you, Phil. I appreciate that. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, as he said, I'm Kirk Burton. I'm with Bike Cubed. My current position is that I support the Department of Defense Small Business Innovation Research Office over in the Mark Center. I do policy work and, and acquisition support there. Uh, prior to that, I have 40 years of experience working in and around the military. And for the last 15 years, I've been involved in technology development for national security clients as an entrepreneur, a program manager, and with a couple of small business incubators in the Southeast. So I'm gonna give a very high level overview of the process involved in DOD acquisition. To really go into detail on this topic, it's generally a week or more of classes. So for that reason, many of my slides today are intended to give you information that's a very basic overview to give some understanding of concepts and terminology, and that will allow you to do some future research. The goal is to provide you with information to help you ask better questions as you seek to understand the acquisition system. The bottom line is, I'm not going to make you an expert in the next 20 minutes. Next slide. So the acquisition technology and logistics lifecycle management framework. This chart, which is really impressive when you print it as a horse blanket and lay it across a table, provides a high level graphic overview of the interaction between the components of the DOD acquisition system. As you can see, it's complicated. Notice the three colored bands on the chart. At the top is the Joint Capabilities Integration and Development System, known by its acronym, JSIDS. Next is the Defense Acquisition System in yellow, and at the bottom, the Planning, Programming, Budgeting, and Execution System. In my short time today, I'm gonna to talk about the bottom two, the defense acquisition system and planning, programming, budgeting, and execution, or commonly called PPBES. Next slide. From concept to deployment, a weapon system goes through three decision processes to identify the requirement, establish a budget, and acquire the system. The defense acquisition system is event-driven, and it's used for developing or buying an item or system. You can think of it as kind of the overall management process. J 
JSIDS is needs driven. It's the process by which DOD identifies, assesses, and prioritizes what capabilities the military needs in order to fulfill the mission. Capabilities documents are produced through the JSIDS process, and they include an initial capabilities document, or ICD, a capability development document, CDD, and the capability production document, or CPD. JSIDS is a lengthy and complex process, and it's currently under review at various levels to determine how to make the process faster and in which instances it should apply. Next slide. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on PPBES. It's a calendar-driven system and the process used to secure funding for major acquisition programs. So quick look. What you see here is the planning cycle. The planning cycle begins with the president's national security strategy. That document results in the development of formal guidance from the Department of Defense to guide the planning process. So from left to right, in addition to the president's national security strategy, is the national defense strategy that comes from the Secretary of Defense's office, the national military strategy, which comes from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the defense strategy review, which was formerly called the quadrennial defense review, that should sound familiar to many of you, that forms the basis of the defense planning guidance. For the unclassified documents on this list, you can find those electronically online. Just ask Mr. Google, I'm sure that he can help you find where they are. Next slide. So programming. Programming is the first major effort that turns those strategic documents and the guidance into a process that becomes executable programs. The programming process, the most common document that you'll hear referred to is the Program Objective Memorandum, or POM. That is the process that, that allocates resources across a six year period, including the current budget year, for programs across the department. The final programming decisions that are made in the POM process are documented in a program decision memorandum or PDM. Next slide. Budgeting. Budgeting is another complex process only because the DOD is required to submit two year budgets, but Congress appropriates money on a yearly basis. So every year you go in and, and take the second year of that budget submission from the previous year, change it just a little bit to turn it into reality for the current budget year, and then project another year out. There are several documents involved in that process, a budget estimate submission, which specifies fiscal requirements for the next, next budget cycle for services and agencies. Those are submitted through the OSD comptroller. Program budget decisions are documents um, that the DOD provides input to the president's budget. There are occasionally, as you might ex expect in the process, decisions made and resources allocated where somebody has a problem with it. Major budget issues are unresolved issues that come up from the services through appeals process. They identify programs as, as major budget initiatives or major budget issues, sorry, and um, provide documentation, go through a process to adjudicate those. Usually uh, the final outcome of that decision is that the services identify offsets to buy back a capability if they deem that it is a higher priority. Final step in the process is the DOD submission for inclusion in the president's budget. Uh, for example, the submission for the FY20 budget is ongoing right now within the Pentagon. Next slide. Execution is the final phase. Resources come together, contracts are awarded, and work gets done. Execution also involves program evaluations where programs are measured against pre-established performance metrics and those could include obligation and expenditure rates, and I'll touch on those briefly in a minute. 
The focus is on determining if planned program goals are being met. Next slide. So this is the final slide for the planning programming budget system. And this is an example of a document that you can find on the DTIC website. DTIC has a very rich repository of budget information. If you're gathering intelligence on programs, on locations, it's an excellent way to find information. So this is an example of an R2, a budget item justification for a research and development program within the department. It justifies the expenditure of R&D funds. This is a multi-page document. So what you see here is the first page and it identifies costs throughout those program years that I discussed. So it goes from 17 out through 2023. Those are allocated against a PE or a program element. You can see that that number is in the top right. Um, R1 program element number, and it'll give you the, the type. As you go down through there, you'll see the allocation of research and development funds against various project lines for this program. If you were to see the follow-on pages to this document, there would be discussions of missions, there would be discussions of justification for the budget line, and then there would be some planned milestones or events and metrics. So again, a really good source of information if you're gathering information. Next slide. So to give a little bit of context on the defense acquisition system and milestones, Milestones are over, used to oversee and manage acquisition programs. At each milestone, a program must meet specific statutory and regulatory requirements before the program can proceed to the next phase of the acquisition process. So you will hear people refer to milestone decisions, a milestone A decision for a program, or a milestone B decision. This is what they're talking about. Milestone A, when someone makes a milestone A decision and says go, that initiates the technology development. Milestone B initiates engineering and manufacturing development. And milestone C initiates production and deployment. The defense acquisition system that we're talking about here is what I refer to as big A acquisitions. These are the large programs, lots of dollars against these programs and they're often called programs of record. If you're a small business participating in the SBIR, STTR programs, this is often the target for insertion of your technology. In contrast, a small A acquisition effort is governed by less rigid and complex requirements. Next slide. So this shows the acquisition life cycle, and I've combined different things on this slide. So the small triangles at the top are those milestone decisions. So you can see milestone A decision. That's still within the pre-systems acquisition. What happens before milestone A is an evaluation usually involving an analysis of alternatives that determines whether or not a material acquisition is necessary to solve the problem or develop a capability. In that process, they look at whether or not the uh, required capability can come about through some other means. Can it come about through training? Can it come about through a change of doctrine? Or is this something that's going to require a material acquisition? Milestone B is a development decision. So during that engineering and manufacturing development stage that follows a milestone B, the government is looking for five conditions to be met. They're looking for a stable design. They want a system that meets validated capability requirements, and those would be demonstrated by initial operational testing. Manufacturing processes are checked and have to demonstrate that they're under control. Industrial production capabilities are checked to see if they're reasonably available to be able to produce. And the system must meet all engineering phase exit requirements. Milestone C is when the program's reviewed for entrance into that final phase of production and deployment. Prior to milestone C, 
a decision authority considers cost estimates, manpower estimates, a system threat assessment, environmental issues, and compliance with the DOD strategic plan. Next slide. So I'm only gonna talk about this very briefly, but this is a very good reference slide um, for what people refer to as the Valley of Death. You can see overlaid on this, the milestone decisions, A, B, and C, where those occur. Below that, I have the technology readiness levels, which are used in the research and development process. And then at the bottom in blue, I have the phases, which could be an SBIR or an STTR project. I also have some information there on manufacturing readiness levels and on uh, budget. So this is a good reference for you to look at for the future. Um, basically, that value of debt is the challenging time between about uh, TRL five and six, when you have a very, I won't say immature, but less mature technology. It's hard to sell that technology to somebody, but it's also at a point where you may not have development dollars to continue the development. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk just briefly about color money. I'll do that pretty quick. Um, go ahead, next slide. Here's some references. I encourage you to look at those when you have time. Next slide. So color money within DOD really refers to the appropriations that we're talking about. There are appropriations listed on the slide, operation and maintenance, research and development, procurement, military personnel, and military construction. Operations and maintenance is used for day-to-day -day activities to include base operations. This is where you buy things to keep your posts and stations open, copy paper, services. Procurement is used to purchase major end items and defense systems. It's also used for initial spares when you're fielding a system, and it can be used for major modifications to fielded systems. Military personnel, of course, is pay and allowance for active duty and reserve components. It's for permanent change of station moves, reenlistment bonuses, and accrual of retired pay. And military construction funds are used for major construction projects. These would include bases, schools, missile storage, maintenance facilities, healthcare facilities, and housing. Next slide. I'll just briefly touch on the appropriations life cycle. Um, this ties back to the comment that I made earlier about the uh, obligation rates being a metric, so that's kind of the only thing I'm going to touch here. So this, what this shows you is in blue, that shows you how many years an appropriation is available for obligation. So the money is available to a program manager or base commander or whomever if it's O&M for one year. Research, development, test evaluation, rdt and &E money is two-year money. Procurement is three years, ships and military construction is five years, and a military personnel account is a one-year account. So current period, that blue, what that means is that money is available for obligation. I can put that money if it's an rdt and &E contract. I have two years from when Congress gives me that money to put it on a contract. If I haven't done that in two years, it goes back to the Treasury. So for that reason, obligation rates are one of the critical measures used in the department to track execution. There are requirements laid out for programs by fiscal quarter, and they'll have a percentage that they have to meet for obligation of funds for each of those quarters. So again, this has been a down and dirty, very high level overview. Um, Happy to address questions if you have some of those afterwards, if we have time, and I will pass it on now to my colleague, Chris. Thank you, Kirk. Uh, I really appreciate that background. I think it gives us a great overview of the Agrison process. And, and now I'd like to turn it over to Chris Harris to take us through sort of how do we now take that process down to the mechanics of government contract and how we as contractors really uh, integrate with that process. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, as he said, I'm Chris Harris, and I've been around government or commercial contracting for about 18 years now. Um, started with the federal government uh, a few years back, but wound up in uh, DOD 
where I left uh, with an unlimited warrant and uh, dealt with various products such as A&E construction uh, service contracting. And now I'm uh, touching R&D contracting. So it was a, a very rich environment to touch a lot of different things. And as Kurt pointed out earlier, uh, he showed you the entire acquisition process. Uh, we contracting would come in around milestone B when uh, we actually decided that we were going to buy something and publish the RQ right around that time. And as Kurt said, this will be a high level because we only have a certain amount of time. And hopefully I will answer many of your questions uh, that you sent in earlier. Next slide, please. All right. The first thing to remember about government contracting is that it is heavily driven by statutes, regulations and executive orders. One of the contracting officers main jobs is to make sure that all of this is fulfilled before a contract is signed. The high level document that is used by most agencies is the FAR, the Federal Acquisition Regulation, and some of the agencies also have a supplement. Next slide, please. Okay, contracts, uh, as far as super awards are concerned, super awards, so we're going to talk specifically about that. The SBA Super Policy Directive is the governing document. However, since the uh, awards that are given actually vary, they could be contracts, grants, cooperative agreements, or other transactions, that will determine the supplemental uh, instructions and requirements that are put on industry based on the instrument that the government uses. And there was a question there that said, can we actually negotiate with the government and change uh, some of the terms and conditions? In contracts, you will probably need a waiver because most things are prescribed. Grants and cooperative agreements, it's a little more flexible, but the maximum flexibility belongs in other transaction agreements. Next slide, please. Okay, now when it comes to solicitations, you have the invitation for bid, which is basically uh, what we use in constructions and products, and there's not a lot to be discussed. So it's put the requirement out there and then price and price related factors. And RFQ, RFP, excuse me, uh, is probably the most draconian of uh, solicitation events. A lot of uh, requirements involved there where we look at technical schedule and cost factors, which comes from the PM, by the way. And uh, and then we weigh all of that to come out with the best value uh, solution for the government. An RFQ is very similar. It just has fewer requirements along the way. And then, of course, sole source is when you're dealing with one particular vendor and that process should go uh, much faster. Also, next slide, please. All right. As uh, you saw earlier, there's basically the two main players in any procurement. There's a program, which Kurt was covering some of that when he says, OK, we look to see what the requirement is. We put all of these things together and then we move to the acquisition phase. It is at that point where, next slide, please, the CEO starts to interface with the program to help them develop their requirements and make sure that uh, all of the requirements of law and regulation and executive orders are uh, actually followed. At the end of the day, once we get through working together, the CEO has to sign the contract as the only one who can actually obligate the government. And that is for the initial contracts, the modifications, the cure notices, anything that actually binds us, issue stop work orders and modify the contract. The reason that that is kind of important to uh, contractors is the fact that sometimes you may get a request that actually modifies the contract and you need to know who needs to be involved in that transaction. Next slide, please. Okay, and the contracting officer's representative will normally be someone who's working in the program because the CEO can't be in all places and they probably have at least 10 to 20 contracts to manage. So the core is the person who watches to make sure that the technical and uh, other aspects of the contract are met. The duties of the core may be technical in nature or they may, may be more routine things such as invoices and bill pay and things like that. Next slide, please. Oh, and as you can see here, you have the acquisition timeline. Uh, much of this that you see here encompasses some of what 
Kurt was actually discussing, but you see it's the planning phase, the, the contracting approvals that you'll need to actually move the money through and buy the product, do the RFP, um, and then your evaluation and selection, and then the pre-award things that you'll have to do. Next slide, please. Just to touch this very quickly, the only thing that's different from the slide that you just saw is the post-award activities that the CEO will need to do in order to bring the contract uh, to an end. Everything else pretty much overlaps. Next slide, please. Okay, in planning, one of the things that you'll have to do after you do some market research to determine is what kind of statement of requirements document do we want? Is it that there's a thousand possibilities and we don't know exactly what we want? So is it that we'll publish a suit, a statement of objectives that will just tell the contractor the outcomes that we're seeking and then let them propose the performance work statement? Or is it that we get a little more specific and we describe the results that we want through specifics and objective terms and to find the measurements that we'll use during the procurement? Or is it that it's very routine and we need to prescribe uh, exactly what the contractor is going to do, how many people, how long it's going to take and all these things. So based on the type of work it is, you'll need to pick the type of requirements document that you're going to use. Next slide, please. And contracting methods. For all practical purposes, there are two basic contracting methods. There is the seal bid, where you do very little talking. You define the requirement, and then you use price and price-related factors to uh, make the award. And then there is negotiation, which FAR 15.000 states that all other types of acquisitions are some type of negotiated procurement. Even though they take different forms, Anytime that you have the possibility to discuss, make things better, consider technical and cost factors together to determine which one's the best deal, that is a negotiated procurement. Next slide, please. All right, contracting methods. Uh, you can use this as a reference, but the main thing that I'll point out here is based on the dollar value uh, that the procurement is, you can be sure that the higher the dollar value, the more requirements that they will put on you or on us, by the way, that we have to fulfill. And it usually makes the uh, acquisition take longer because there's more things that we have to do to meet all of the requirements. Next slide, please. All right. Contracting types, fixed price, cost reimbursement and time materials and indefinite delivery. Now, one of the questions that I saw was what determines the type of contract that the government will, will choose? But that's, uh, that's a multiplex because there's many things that could determine that. But uh, I'll give you an example, uh, Cibber. Uh, let's say that I know that most Cibber contractors are unsophisticated and they don't have uh, accounting systems and all the things that we need. Well, I would try to uh, go with a fixed price contract and work it out to such a way where I could do delivery payments where they would not need all of the uh, infrastructure that a regular contractor would need. So in that particular case, the market drove the decision. In another case, the market might say, well, we always procure by cost reimbursement contracts. So no, we're not doing uh, fixed price contracts. So another market driven decision. And then on the other hand, it may be a government driven priority where they say for this type of con uh, type of commodity or service, you will use this type of contract. Uh, time materials, for example, uh, that is considered to be the, mm, the least favorable contract right now. So basically they put up a lot of barriers to keep you from using it, including a bunch of um, justification for using it. Therefore, we don't use it a lot. <laughs> So it just depends on what the actual situation calls for. And in the indefinite delivery contract world, it just basically means that we know we have a need, but we can't figure out the timing or the exact amount of what we will need. So when we can't do that, we usually put an IDIQ in place and then we order as we need it. Next slide, please. 
Okay, the impl implications of contract types. As you know, contracts are about risk. You get a fixed price contract. We make a deal based on certain terms and conditions, the quality of service. And let's say that you estimated that it cost uh, you $10 to provide it and you wrote a contract for $12. Well, let's say it took you $13 to provide it. You still only get $12. <laughs> your price is not adjusted based on your cost experience. So these are inherently more risky for the contractor and to a large degree, a good deal for the government. So hopefully it will work out for everyone. But when you go to cost reimbursement, then the contractor is not actually on the hook most of the time to deliver anything. It's your best efforts to give the government what they want so all of the performance risk and the cost risk are transferred to the government to the extent that we have funding. Continue. Uh, next slide, please. All right. Cost reimbursement contracts. As we were saying, the cost risk is trans, uh, transferred to the government, but there are some uh, restrictions there. Uh, the cost must be allowable, allocable, and reasonable. Uh, allowable. Uh, basically, the government's not going to pay for certain things like alcohol. That's my most famous example. So if it's in your cost structure where you're actually buying alcohol for your um, for your staff, you need to segregate that because the government's not going to pay for it. Allocable. So let's say you have uh, five contracts. Each contract is supposed to share their equal amount of the cost. That's what allocable means. Uh, and then reasonable whatever it is that you're buying and you're trying to charge the government for, just make sure it's what a reasonable uh, person would pay. You can't buy something for 40 grand when the market cost is 20 because you're only going to get reimbursed for 20. Uh, the funds must be available for total cost and the cost risk again shifts from the contractor to the government. Next slide, please. Okay. Incremental funding. Now, this is basically where the government does not fund the entire value of the contract at the time of award, but will uh, piecemeal it like every three months or report it with some schedule until they fund the whole thing or decide they don't want to play anymore. So you, as a contractor, you will have some obligations in this type of arrangement, but we'll talk about that later. Next slide, please. All right. When there is incremental funding, there will be a clause in there that says limitation on funds. And typically the contractor will agree to uh, keep working and manage its costs to uh, actually perform until the government keeps adding increments. The bottom line here is that the government's obligation is limited to the amount of funds available. Next slide, please. Of all the things that you need to remember as a contractor is that since the government has chosen to incrementally fund, you need to keep an eye on how much of the funding that is being expended. For example, so let's say the government puts uh, $600,000 on the contract for the next six months, assuming that they're going to burn $100,000 per month. But let's say for whatever reason, they start burning hotter than that based on the things that they're asking you to do. You need to alert them, third bullet, that they that you're about to burn through 75 percent of the money within the next 60 days so that they will know. Very important to keep getting paid, because if you run over the money and you don't give them the notification, they can refuse to pay you. Not good. <laughs> next slide, please. Okay, incremental funding for fixed price contracts works pretty much the same way. They are they basically say that their liability is limited to the funding on the contract. Next slide, please. Now, in the world of R&D, as Kurt pointed out, uh, basically you have two years to actually spend the money. But to make sure that you obligate what you need, they have this policy of saying, well, look, you need to obligate the money in the first year because we expect that you obligate it and start doing your work. But in the second year, they allow an additional obligation because of the fact that schedules don't always stay in line with what they think they should be. Next slide, please. 
Now, there's one uh, exception to the rule of trying to obligate in the first year and then obligating in the second year as you can or as you need to. There is where the project is actually uh, longer than 12 months. There's no logical way to divide the work and it's clearly not feasible to contract for a shorter period. And then the plan technical effort is such that the contractors in the market say, well, no, we're not going to accept a job without you jumping the whole amount of money on the contract right then. Otherwise, what the government likes to do is they like to incrementally fund R&D projects, because as you can imagine, you've got several going on at the same time. And those that look more favorable, of course, you'll want to shift your money there. This is the reason that this uh, benefits us when we do R&D. Next slide, please. All right, indefinite delivery contracts. As you can see there, there's uh, three types, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. Basically means that you don't know about the delivery times or the quantity that you'll need. We set up a contract uh, with, um, with contractors based on pre-established pricing and a minimum quantity that they are expected to get, and that's the consideration. And then in an indefinite delivery, definite quantity, we don't know the delivery dates, but we know the actual quantity. And then a requirements contract, we estimate a quantity and then say all that we actually buy, we will buy from this particular vendor. And that is the consideration for that particular contract. Next slide, please. Time and materials contract, we covered this briefly, is basically it's a mix between a cost contract and a uh, fixed price contract where each hour is fixed priced and then you work up to a particular ceiling. But the contract is not on the hook, it's actually the best efforts. And the reason that this contract is not uh, particularly favored is that the profit margin can go through the roof as the contractor keeps working and there's absolutely no uh, incentive to control costs. Next slide, please. And then competition requirements. So the, the government has a general rule that all competitions will be full and open, which means all contractors, eligible contractors have the uh, ability to compete. Now, full and open competition is a concept and has several different implementations depending on what part of the FAR you're using. Uh, one of the, it's not an exception, it's uh, full and open after the exclusion of sources where the small business community gets set aside, where large businesses are shut out and then the full and open competitions happens within that community. Next slide, please. And then the only exceptions to full and open competition, they're listed in FAR 6. You can see some of them there. Uh, the ones that deal with the silver program, phase two, phase three, uh, where no further competition is actually needed and the competition is actually satisfied by what you do in phase one. Next slide, please. And now, okay, so evaluation. What well, evaluation proposals of proposals is based on factors listed in the RFP, and it must conform in all material respects to the price, the schedule, and the certifications. The basic source selection process is in FAR Part 15.3, and then of course DOD has a supplement, but there's some other things that you would have to do. Now, in a best value environment, you would probably wind up doing a trade-off, which considers um, price and, and technical factors and takes a mix of both and decides which one provides the best overall deal. If you buy the, if you buy from a vendor that has the highest rated proposal and a higher price, then you have to tell why you're doing it. So you can't just can't pick them, but you have to explain yourself. Lowest price technically acceptable. Basically, you meet a minimum standard as far as technical is concerned. And then from there, it's the lowest price. Uh, or presentations are often used in order to, uh, to limit the amount of paperwork that you have to receive. Next slide, please. And then here you see all of the small business programs. 
that are actually available and it ties back into the slide where we talked about uh, full and open competition after the exclusion of sources. These are the particular programs that uh, many of them that you can actually do a set aside and compete only among them or among small businesses as a whole. And with that, next slide, I think that is the, the end for me. Great, thanks so much, Chris, I really appreciate it. Um, now I'd like to turn it over and introduce uh, Kevin Duncan of K Duncan and Company, who's gonna take us through accounting, contract negotiations and invoicing. And so Kevin, if you wouldn't mind, please uh, unmute your microphone and feel free to begin. Hello everyone. As said, my name is Kevin Duncan. I'm principal of K Duncan and Company, a, an accounting and CPA firm in the Washington DC area. I have been in government contract accounting for about 30 years. Um, actually, let me take that back, 35 years. So um, hopefully I have some gr really great information for you. Next slide, please. So this slide represents what an accounting system is defined as for a government contractor. So I'm gonna take a step back and talk about accounting systems in general first. So what is an accounting system? It's a tool that allows managers to assess the financial performance and the financial health of a company. Um, this is accomplished by the system accumulating, storing, and reporting on financial transactions. The reporting that is achieved by financial statements, mostly, and we'll go into some details, some other detailed reports that are required, but financial statements. So the balance sheet reports on the financial health of the company, and the income statement or profit and loss report report on the financial performance of the company. So in addition to that, excuse me, government contracting is a little different than commercial work. So in the government contracting community, costs or products and services purchased are based on costs, where in the commercial community, Products are, or excuse me, products are purchased based on what the market will bear. So the government has a fiduciary responsibility for to the taxpayer to only buy goods and services based on fair and equitable pricing. And one of the ways that this is determined in the cost-based environment is fair and reasonable costs plus a fair fee. And in order to determine that, the government must meet, be able to see your costs as segregated from your fee and together they're the total price. So looking at this diagram for a government contractor, the accounting system is made up of some various components. The most important and the foundation of the accounting system for a government contractor is the policies and procedures or accounting policies and procedures. Those define how the accounting system is structured, who's responsible for what, what is made up of. So you can see in this slide that the accounting system is made up of software, the personnel that run the accounting system, the contractor's indirect rate structure. Most contractors are providing labor services, so timekeeping becomes vital. Vital. Uh, how the system accumulates costs, how the system reports costs, how you calculate your indirect rates, and then ultimately what we all care about is how you bill costs back to the government. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna start with some terminology. So I just talked about accounting policy. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the chart of accounts, which you'll see a little more detail on slides 56 and 57 when we get to them. But the chart of accounts is a tool within any accounting system that allows you to structure your financial reports. Then um, for FAR 31 is the part of the FAR that discusses um, the costing. And it really has the definitions of types of costs and how they should be treated in your accounting system. So if I had only one part of the FAR to know and read 
it would be FAR Part 31. But then again, I'm an accountant. Then we have the Defense Contract Audit Agency, better known as DCAA. And DCAA is the government audit, it's probably the biggest and most well-known audit agency within the government. And it is a department within the Department of Defense. However, if you have contracts in other agencies, many times the other agencies will pay DCAA to come and do audits for them. And also relative to accounting systems, if your company is being, if your company's accounting system is being reviewed by DCAA, they will use the standard form 1408 as a basis for that review. And the 1408 is a checklist of the requirements that are needed in order for your, your system to be considered adequate. And the FAR says that in order for a contractor to have a um, cost reimbursable contract, to be awarded a cost reimbursable contract, that they must have an adequate accounting system. Then the next term is source, a source documents. And a source document is a document that starts a transaction. For example, for labor costs, the source document would be a timesheet. And for um, uh, ODC or other direct cost or vendor invoice would be the source document for the other direct cost. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the accounting system is important for a government contractor because contracts within the government are cost-based. So it becomes important for the government to know what are the costs that you are accumulating on one or each particular contract with the government. So in order for your accounting system to be able to accumulate and report on those costs, your accounting system must be able to do job costing. And that is the accumulation of costs, direct costs by contract, and then the ability to allocate indirect costs to each of those contracts. Next term is general ledger. The general ledger is the bucket within the accounting system that captures and accumulates all of the transactions that go through your system. Then we have indirect cost pools. And let me talk a little bit more about indirect costs. And I always start by doing the converse, which are direct costs. So direct costs are costs that you will incur to adhere to the statement of work of your contract. Indirect costs are all other costs that you would incur. So for example, a direct cost may be direct labor or direct subcontractor costs that you would incur to do the work, the state, adhere to the statement of work of the contract. However, if you have direct labor, then you're also going to have fringe benefits costs, which are comprised of pay time off, um, health care costs, payroll taxes, et cetera. So there needs to be a mechanism for the contractor to actually get reimbursed for those indirect costs. And that is accomplished through indirect rates. So when you, let's assume you have a cost plus contract and you're invoicing the government for direct labor. So the indirect rate of fringe benefits would be your fringe benefits costs and it will allow you to recover those fringe benefits costs when you build the government. And then typically many contractors will also have different indirect pools. So it may have fringe benefits, overhead, and GNA. And so you'll have an indirect rate for each of those pools. And we'll talk a little bit about that in, as we go along. Then, as mentioned earlier, there are unallowable costs. Now, from my perspective, these are the costs that the government is saying that the taxpayer will not pay for. So the example we mentioned earlier was, was alcohol and beverages. Um, there are a couple of more, I think the popular ones or the ones that are used most often are going to be interest expense. So if you incur interest from your line of credit, that is not a, that is an unallowable cost, not a reimbursable cost. Or federal income taxes, unallowable cost, not a reimbursable cost. And FAR 31 defines which costs are allowable and which costs are unallowable. 
Then we have labor distribution. As I mentioned, most of the services, are, well, most contracts are services contracts, which means the government is buying your labor. And so when an auditor is looking at your accounting system, it must be able to show and report on labor. And this is done through a labor distribution report. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So a lot of times I hear the question, what, or which accounting systems are approved by the government? Or maybe what's the best accounting system for a government contractor? So the answer is that the government does not approve any particular accounting system, which may be different than what's properly thought. Um, but in a, instead, the government has criteria by which an accounting system would be deemed adequate. And that, excuse me, that is on the form standard form 1408. And we'll briefly go through that as we go along. But I would say for small businesses, what I see mostly is QuickBooks. So a contractor could have QuickBooks, Peachtree, um, Sage, uh, a Dell Tech product. The government doesn't care as long as it adheres to the standard form 1408. Now, if you chose QuickBooks, then you would need to choose one of their versions that has job costing. And unfortunately, the standard version and the online versions of QuickBooks do not have job costing, so they would not be considered adequate. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're gonna go back to the chart of accounts. Here is a listing of the standard numbering for uh, the county systems chart of accounts. And specifically for a government contractor, so when we get past the balance sheet accounts, which are one through 4,000 in this example, and get to the P&L or income statement accounts, 5,000, 6,000 and on, these, this structure is a typical structure that I would expect to see. And notice that there's a section, the 9,000 accounts, where we accumulate the unallowable costs. Next slide. So this is a little small, but here you'll see how the excuse me, the income statement accounts or p &L accounts are structured so that there is a, so a parent account for direct costs, fringe benefits, overhead costs in this example, and then their child accounts where this allows all of the costs under a particular pool, direct or indirect pool, to roll up so that you have a total calculated. Next slide, please. So you can see that happening here on this example from QuickBooks. So you'll see how all of the 5,000 accounts add up so they have total direct costs. You'll see where all the 6,000 accounts add up so that I have all of my fringe benefits total. And this makes it much simpler to calculate your indirect rates. Next slide. Okay, and then we have the example of showing the GNA cost, and some unallowable costs. So you'll see down in the un unallowable costs are interest expense, contributions, and entertainment. Next slide, please. So let's take a step back and talk about labor costs. So in a government contractor county system and really a government contractor accounting environment, everyone needs to actually do a timesheet. And many times people ask me, well, why does an owner need to do a timesheet even though they're not um, billing to a contract? And the reason is that, remember a little while ago, I said that the government has a fiduciary responsibility to only buy fair and reasonable prices or goods and services. And with that is a cost-based system. So that owner that's not billing direct labor to a contract actually is billing their labor costs to GNA. And so there's a GNA rate calculated, 
But then again, if there's a source document that supports every transaction. So if the owner is not charging, does not have a timesheet as a source document for their labor costs, then really the government's perspective is the labor costs aren't really real. So even though you paid them without a source document, there is no cost. So this slide shows how labor hours are accumulated in the accounting system. And ultimately those hours will be um, changed to cost, which will show up in your general ledger and ultimately show up on your financial reports. And as I said, is submitted in your GNA rate, which will allow you to recover those costs on the contract. Next slide, please. One of the criteria on the standard form 1408 is that the contractor has a labor distribution that shows cost charged to, uh, they call it cost objectives. So that in direct cost, a direct cost objective would be a contract. An indirect cost, it would just be a general ledger account. So the labor distribution report that the government would expect to see has a lot of detail in it. For direct labor, you'll see that there's a name, which is the contract. There's a source name, which is the actual employee. There's an item, and especially for time and material contracts, this is typically a um, labor category, LCAT. And then there are the hours and the cost, so that the government will be able to audit a contract or audit a contractor when the contractor has this level of detail. Sometimes, con you know, when contractors are small or maybe even later, they'll have an outsourced payroll. And people ask me, well, do I need all this individual detail in my accounting system when I'm using an outsourced payroll? Well, actually you do because the government expects or requires to be able to audit your contract. And typically, unfortunately, those audits usually come years later. So if the government wanted to audit your contract and you have billed, I don't know, 10,000 hours of a labor category to a particular contract, and then they say, okay, prove to me that those costs are good. You wanna have something like this that will show each individual transaction that's charged to that contract so that the government can audit that and test it and make sure that what you build them is correct. If they're not able to audit, then the costs are um, excuse me, unsubstantiated and the government may ask for a refund. Next slide. So this indicates or demonstrates job costing. As I said, the contractor must be able to accumulate costs by contract. And you can see here that this report is accumulating revenue and direct costs by contract and actually even a level down for this first cost plus contract example, it has CLINs that add up to the total contract and these total amounts for all the contracts should add up to the exact amount that you have on your company-wide P&L. Next slide. This is a tool within QuickBooks that allows you to set up and actually build to the government labor categories on time and material contracts. Next slide. And this is a, a tool or a system within QuickBooks that allows you to actually create an invoice. So I want to take a step back. So the government's expectation is that when you bill them on an invoice that your costs are, or the basis for the cost that you're billing the government are coming from your accounting system. If you're doing parallel systems like spreadsheets to accumulate the cost, we know that there are opportunities for mistakes. So the government really expects that your accounting system is producing the data that will allow you to invoice them. Next slide. 
Okay, so this is an example of an invoice created within the accounting system. Next slide. So we talked about indirect rates and, um, and their purpose. So let me just reiterate, indirect rates are a mechanism used to allow the contractor to uh, get reimbursed for their indirect costs. So especially on cost plus contracts, the government expects that the contractor is gonna monitor and um, pay close attention to their indirect rates because the indirect rates of one are the basis for the pricing on contracts. And if it's a cost plus contract, they're also, they're also the basis for invoicing month to month. So if you're invoicing um, these rates, so 32% friends, 11% overhead, 10% GNA, and your actual indirect rates are higher, that means that typically you're losing money on the contract. If your actual indirect rates are lower, that means that basically you're overbilling the government. So there's an expectation that you're routinely, monthly, looking at your indirect rates and comparing them against the indirect rates that you're billing on your contracts. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, some details about the accounting policies and procedures. This should be a written document, and you'll find that when DCAA comes to do an accounting system review, this is the first thing they'll ask for. So it's going to include the description of the accounting system, a uh, description of the company's indirect rate structure, very important, the timekeeping policies of the company, how you treat and accumulate unallowable costs, what costs are considered direct, direct versus indirect in your company, how you treat B&P and R&D costs, what are your company's billing procedures, uh, how you calculate indirect rates and how often, uh, what's your budget preparation and process, and your contract briefs. Do you uh, create and use contract briefs within your company? Next slide. So I'll just do this quickly. If your accounting system is being reviewed, the most important thing that an auditor is gonna look for is the audit trail, which means in the case of labor, you're gonna start with the source document, the timesheet, trace that through a payroll register, trace that to the labor distribution, to the general ledger, to the job cost system, and ultimately to an invoice to a government. And the most important thing is that everything must match. Next slide. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about contract negotiation. And there's a big difference to me, in my experience, between whether it's a sole source contract or a competitive contract. In that, if it's sole source, there's usually more things to negotiate. But let's, so the scenario is that you've been awarded a contract, you've been notified that you've been awarded a contract. The government will send you the contract document and then you will read it very intently because anything that's in the contract document, you are signing up for um, being able to deliver. So when you read the contract intently, there may be things in there that you don't really agree with. And then, they, you know, so for example, and if it's sole source, actually the government might come back and say, let's negotiate the fee percent. But in not sole source, in other contracts, then maybe some of the things are for the statement of work, maybe some things are you just want to modify, like the delivery time. It says 15 days, and for whatever reason you want it to be 14 days, you want to be able to bring that up before the contract sign, get it changed in the contract document itself. And then in section I of the contract, we'll have all of the contract clauses. In my experience, sometimes there are clauses in there that don't even relate to the type of contract that you have. So you wanna go through those contract clauses and if there are some in there that you don't feel should be there or there are some that are missing, then you would want to have that discussion with the contracting officer and negotiation. 
Then for invoicing, in section G, typically there are invoice instructions. And so if there's something that you want changed about the invoicing process or timing, then this is the time to do it. For example, the FAR gives small businesses the ability to invoice twice every two weeks at a minimum. So if that is what you want in your contract, this is the time to discuss that with the contracting officer. Whereas the original contract, may, the draft may say monthly, if you want it every two weeks, then this is the time to discuss that. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of the uniform contract format. In the prior slide, I mentioned different sections of the contract. This goes over all of the typical sections or really the, unit, the format of a contract for section A, B, et cetera. So next slide, please. And these are the other sections of the contract. Next slide, please. Invoicing. So as a small business, invoicing is probably the most vital thing that you do. So performance on the contract and invoicing are just ultimately important. So my suggestion is always before that first invoice is sit, sent out to the government that you create a um, draft invoice and then submit that to the contracting officer for feedback. Because the last thing you want to do is submit your first invoice, the government has some problems with it, and then your payment is delayed. Because the Prompt Payment Act says that the government will pay you within 30 days for an accurate invoice. So if your invoice is not accurate, there's like maybe there's some data missing, then they don't have to pay you until you correct it. And then when they get the accurate invoice, that's when the clock starts again. So you don't want that to get delayed by 15 days or 30 days because you missed something. Um, the format of an invoice will be greatly determined by the contract type. So fixed price contracts are typically going to have much simpler invoice formats, much less information, time and material contracts, as the hybrid will have a little bit more. So they will have labor hours by um, labor category. And then cost plus contracts typically are gonna have the most information where you're gonna to have to show costs, the, how the indirect rates are applied and the fee, et cetera. Next slide, please. So this slide shows a typical cost plus contract invoice. And you can see that there's at the top, there's contract data, what's the contract about, the fee, and then um, below that, the individual costs. So labor costs plus the fringe and overhead, um, indirect, other direct costs after that, subcontract costs, GNA, and all this is applied to create the entire invoice. Next slide. So I think we're ready for the summary. Thanks so much, Kevin. I really appreciate it. So we, we have a little bit of time left. Um, I want to take some time from the, that we've gathered, some questions that we've gathered during the workshop. Um, so my, my first question is really for, I think, uh, Chris and, and yourself, Kevin. A recurring question that kept coming up was um, about the sort of the difference between the build um, invoice amount and the uh, proposed invoice amount as it relates to indirect rates. And so we have a lot of questions that, um, the sort of structure around this one. What should you do if you realize after contract award that the proposed rates are too low and the provisional or incurred cost rates are much higher than originally budgeted? And so, Kevin, I think I think I'd like to start with you on that. Um, any thoughts on when those when those differ? Sure. So let me talk about the process. So if this, and I'm assuming this is a cost reimbursable contract. So what happens is that when you do your proposal, you'll have some indirect rates built in. And then when you are awarded the contract, you could either start with those or many times, especially in DOD environment, the government will ask you to submit a budget, 
uh, or in a proposal for provisional indirect rates. And those provisional indirect rates would be what you would actually put on your invoice. And again, they should be based on a budget for the company for the period of performance that you're going to be billing. So in this example, maybe uh, for the rest of 2018. If you find that your actuals are substantially different than your provisional rates, you are pretty much required to notify the contracting officer of that situation. But also keep in mind two things. One, that if your actuals are considerably higher than your provisionals, then it's gonna eat up your funding faster. Second is that the government's expectation is that you're able to control your indirect rates. Okay. Got it. Um, Chris, any thoughts from you from the contracting side? Well, no, just like uh, like you said, there's some practical consequences of that. Uh, sometimes, um, let's say your indirect rates are based on five or six contracts. You lose two or three of them, mm -hmm. and now your indirect rates are different and higher, and you need to absorb them. That's a conversation. But like he says, uh, depending on how much money the government has, it might make performance a lot shorter if they went on the expectation of having lower indirect rates. Got it. That makes and sense. don't have other money to kind of stand in the gap for that. Got it. That makes sense. Um, this next question, I think, is in sticking on the contracting vein. There's a couple of questions about what happens if during the course of a contract, particularly in the SBIR world, uh, there's a roadblock, like a technical roadblock. We can't get the feasibility. Is the contract canceled? Should it be canceled? Um, and then I guess the second question that came up was, is, is there any guarantee on the government side that they won't just cancel a contract for reasons outside the small businesses kind of rationale? No guarantee whatsoever. Uh, the ability for a government to cancel a contract or terminate it is that's the language yeah. that is inherent to government contracting. So there's termination for convenience and termination for default, right? So let's say that you're moving along and the government decides that it no longer needs what you're offering, mm -hmm. even though they did at the time, they can terminate that contract for convenience at any time. And the dangerous thing about the termination authority of the government is even if that clause is not in the contract, it can be read into the contract as if it is there because it is a required contract for government contracts specifically. Any other type of contract, it would be a breach once you enter a contract, but being that it's the government and you're not dealing with two equal parties, you're dealing with the big boy and then the, the person who's actually trying to get their money that's a specific feature. Uh, but then if it's termination where they just decide you're not doing your job, you don't want to be there, that's uh, all kinds of uh, bad consequences on that, where they collect money from you, repicture at your expense, and all these types of things. But his general question is, no, there's no way to get out of the government's ability to terminate. Got it. Um, Could I add something here? Please. So typically, Actually, per the FAR, if the government terminates for convenience and you are incurring additional costs simply because you have to, then you are entitled to bill the government to get reimbursed for those closeout costs. But you will have to prove that you had to incur them. Got it. Thanks so much. This is another question that came in uh, and I think is really uh, compelling, actually. So the government continues to request that prime contractors obtain detailed pricing, including indirect rates from subcontractors. But we all know that subcontractors are competitors with the primes, and so some of the subs would prefer to not give their detailed indirect rates to the primes. Um, but it seems like the instructions on the solicitations today are sort of taking that to account. Any thought on the government's thinking and, and what contractors may be able to do to get around that? Um, I think we'll start with uh, Chris on this one. Yeah, being that we know that these sensitivities exist, when we have uh, have to request a cost breakdown from a sub, we have them send that information directly mm. to us okay. so that we can examine it. But the, the prime, who might be a competitor on the next proposal, right. won't get to see it. 
Got it. Okay. Uh, Kevin, any, from, from your experience with any small businesses, same advice, go directly to the uh, CEOs? Yes, same advice. And they typically called it a, a sealed bid package. I mean, uh, 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 it's where, right, where the proprietary information is safeguarded. Got it. Kurt, in, in your remarks, we, we heard a lot about the, the budget process and how that affects the programs. How early can contractors or people trying to gather intelligence how early is that information available um, in, in the cycle that you kind of described? And how can we use it best to our advantage? So the information is really just available in the first available in the budget documents. I mean, you get a little bit of information in the out years, but as you would mm -hmm. expect, as you get six years from now, there's not as much detail on exactly um, what's going to be involved in the spending for the program. So you get more detail in the budget years, those two years, year of execution in the next year, than you do in those out years. But you will start to see for large programs, you'll start to see a funding line up to six years out. Great. Um, so uh, next question, uh, this is probably for Kevin. If you're a small business, can you ask, for um, X about a payment shorter than net 30? Is that possible you were seeing that? You can request it. Um, you know, it's up to the contracting officer's discretion as to whether they'll do it or not. I would say some of my clients typically, especially with DOD, they're using um, WAFI, WAFI payment system. They are usually seeing their payments come in faster than 30 days anyway. Got it. Got it. Thanks so much. Um, Chris, you mentioned OTAs in your remarks. Are, are, you, are you seeing more of that nowadays? Is that something the government's trying to move toward? And, and is that something we should more, see more of in the coming years? Yeah, especially in the R&D world, they're moving towards those because the um, uh, require, the competition requirements are not as uh, arduous. And uh, in many instances, they can't be protested and things like that. And they're not subject to general procurement laws like other uh, procurement instruments. So uh, you do, do see us moving towards that, especially in uh, the R&D, because if we need something, we don't need it two or three years from now while we're arguing about a contract in the courts. Things like that. Kurt, any thoughts? Yeah, can I add something? Um, so I, the use of OTAs is going to be sort of, at least at this point in time, agency specific. Um, I had a conversation with a senior acquisition person from the Special Operations Command a couple of months ago, and and she said that their the way that they view an OTA is, is as a tool in a toolbox, mm -hmm. and they apply it for those companies who are not ready yet for a standard contract. So they might use it once with a company, but if they use it once, then by the time that OTA is finished, they're going to expect you to be at a point where they could issue you a standard cost plus contract. And, and that that what you're really saying is that you have the accounting appropriate accounting system, correct methodologies to handle a cost yeah, plus contract. Yep, that's okay. right. Um, any thoughts from from the group here around flow down provisions that we see in contracts from the primes to their subs, i.e., the smalls? Um, Kevin, I don't know if you've seen any of that with your clients. Any any recommendations on what people should look out for from that regard? I think when you're a subcontractor or you're a contractor with the government in general, then you're always looking at the contract clauses to make sure that there's something that you don't have objection to. So typically the prime will flow down the clauses directly to the subcontractor. So, you know, it's like any business deal, you're looking to protect your own position. Got it. Um, a couple of quick rapid fire questions. Uh, Kevin, is marketing an allowable or an unallowable expense? Marketing is, is an allowable cost. Advertising is an unallowable cost. So the difference, yeah. Between, yeah, Go ahead. the difference between the two. So in the FAR, it says that advertising costs are the cost that you incur to promote your company. So in, in using third party media, um, primarily. So if you do a television radio ad or 
and they had a newspaper that would be considered advertising. Um, but if you have marketing costs, meaning that you have people who are actually going out and marketing for your company, those costs would be allowable. Got it. Uh, same question, are patent costs allowable or unallowable? Could you repeat that? Are the co patent costs? Patent costs? Oh, that's a sticky one. Um, okay. Generally, yes, but there are some very well-defined criteria that I don't know off the top of my head. No worries. Um, and then what is the difference between an item number, a CLIN, and an ACRN? So an ACRN, an acronym, is a funding number. Uh, item number to, to me and CLIN are very similar and they're actually used in different ways, but they are just subsets of the contract. So typically a uh, contract line item number in a T&M contract may be used to define different labor categories or may be used to define different tasks, but it, it really is a way to subset a contract. Got it. And then, Chris, this last question I think is for you. Um, is there any expectation that DOD will move to firm fixed price phase two SBIR contracts as opposed to cost plus fixed fee uh, phase two contracts? If they would take our advice, that would be it. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not all so lucky. So, so we are trying to get them to move in that direction because it can uh, make the award process a lot quicker if you don't have to rely on like the systems and the things that you have to have in place for cost plus fixed fee. So the, there was some legislation that made it easier to do that. Uh, what do you call that performance-based payments, uh -huh. not based on cost, but based on experience. So uh, legislation and everything else is moving in that direction. Got it. So this, now this truly is the last question. I'm, I'm glad this came up. Talk to us a little bit about mods and, and, when a when a company should try and do a mod, how how do they how do we balance scope creep? And when we're really, you know, we're beyond the scope, and we really need to get a mod. Is it? Is yeah, it, yeah, You know, yeah. what's the driver there? Well, the, the driver is this: you're sitting in a, a program's office, and you're actually performing the work. And you know, customers they ask for things that mm -hmm. you may not have thought of during uh, the time that you proposed. If it's a small thing, doesn't cost anything, it's not, you know, breaking the bank, but just an inconvenience, I might not because it, there's always a possibility of making them angry, sure. right? But to the extent that it causes a, a difference in what it costs you to do business, I would very much be trying to get in front of the CEO and say, hey, I, uh, I can do that for you, but that would uh, require a mod and here's why. So I'd always build a bridge with them to say, hey, not trying to nickel and dime you here, explain, and then try to get over to the CEO and get the modification. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. Um, and so with, with that, I'd like to introduce Lynn Jenkins, uh, who's the small business subject matter expert here at BiQ. She's gonna take us through some of the upcoming workshops in this series and the next steps for participants today. Um, Lynn. Please take it away. Yes. Thank you very much, Phil. And thank you very much to our presenters today. You've provided us with the wealth of information. We appreciate your participation. And also thank you all participants who participated today. As you know, this workshop is part of an ongoing series we are hosting about the Sibber Sitter program. Our next workshop will be on September 4th. It's going to cover marketing, business development, and capture management. So a lot of the tools, technologies, uh, methods to get to the, you know, help you get to commercialization. On September 18th, we'll go over commercialization assistance programs and beyond phase two considerations. So an important one for the SBIR, STTR companies that are looking to move their technologies beyond the valley of death into commercialization or transition. And October 9th, we will have a, a, a webinar on testing evaluation. To register for the upcoming workshops, please follow the URL provided on the bottom of the slide. Next slide. Please save the date for the business uh, for the Beyond Phase 2 and Mentor Protege Training Week. And I'll allow you to read that on your own. All the information is in the slide. It's a wealth of information. Next slide. Gives you more information about what you can expect at that actual, um, at that seminar. 
Next slide. Also save the day for DARPA's D60 Symposium. It's in the Oxon Hill, Maryland area at the Gaylord, September 5th to 7th. Information and other registration uh, links are found at the bottom of this slide. Next slide. Provides you a little bit more about what you can expect at that event as well. And in terms of commercialization, working with prime contractors, understanding programs and upcoming requirements, these are excellent events events that you want to attend to because you meet a lot of people, you, you figure out what the government's looking for, and you might find a, a great contact that you need that will help you get some of the questions that you need to have answered. Next slide. So our next steps for today, please visit our, our website to look for information on past workshops. All of our workshops are recorded. There's a transcript, Q&A. A lot of questions that we received are covered in previous workshops. In addition, please take time to fill out the post-workshop survey. The link will come up as soon as we conclude or at the conclusion of this uh, webinar. This helps us provide better um, content for upcoming presentations as well as to ensure that we're responding to your questions. If you need to connect with us, please contact us via email at sbrtraining at bytecube.com. And again, we wanna take this time to thank all of you for taking the time out of your schedules to attend this workshop and all of our previous workshops. We wish you a great day.